The more we use antibiotics, the more bacteria become resistant, and soon they will consume us all. Okay, maybe not, but it is really important as physicians that we're good antibiotic stewards for our patients and for our communities. So today we talked to University of Nebraska Infectious Disease Fellow, Dr. Mackenzie Kynes, on how we can be good antibiotic stewards. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a show by me, Dr. Brad Block, and this is a practical guide for practicing physicians where we interview experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. Mackenzie Kynes, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Brad. Good to be here. So today we're going to be talking about antibiotic stewardship and something near and dear to your heart because you're an ID fellow. But before we get started, just give the audience um, a little summary about yourself. Yeah, so I'm Mackenzie Kainz. I am an infectious disease fellow here at University of Nebraska Medical Center. I have, like you said, my passion stewardship, and I'm taking actually a third year to study that a little bit further next year. Wow. So is that like on top of the fellowship in additional year in research or is it like public health? What, how does that, what does that mean? Yes. My third year is going to be primarily spent building our outpatient stewardship program here at Nebraska Medicine. It is both learning and hands-on training. Okay. So what is, what is an outpatient stewardship program? It's seeing patients and not giving them antibiotics. It's figuring out how your outpatient clinics are doing with prescribing antibiotics and giving some helpful tidbits about how to maybe prescribe them a little bit more appropriately or optimize that therapy. Okay, got it, got it. So I, I being an otolaryngologist, off the bat, I have a recommendation for my pediatric colleagues, and that would be to get a tympanometer. The tympanometer measures the eardrum movement. So if you have a kid who has, and you think, you know, kids, it's hard to see in their little ear canals and see if they have an ear infection, right? And a tympanometer is going to help you figure out if their eardrum is moving or not. And if it's moving normally, it's a lot less likely that they've actually got acute otitis media. If it's not moving, it means that there's fluid behind the drum, which may or may not be infected, but at least it gives you a little more information for that decision-making because you'll feel a lot more comfortable if it's like a completely normal tympanogram, a type A. So, sorry, that before we get started into the infectious disease, Dr. Hurley, everybody's here to hear, not me. I just wanted to give my little insight into how to, how to prescribe fewer antibiotics. That is an approach I wouldn't have thought of. So thank you for that. But uh, here we go, an otolaryngologist. Um, okay, so what are some conditions that are commonly treated with antibiotics that won't benefit? You know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is like sepsis, right? You, you don't really don't need antibiotics in sepsis. I really hope you're using the antibiotics for sepsis, but there are definitely some things that I would appreciate if maybe we could cut back a little bit on. So big one inpatient for me is asymptomatic bacteria. There are some clinical situations where that should be treated. That's primarily in pregnant patients, in patients having a urologic procedure upcoming, and then patients that have had a renal transplant. But otherwise, if they don't have symptoms, you can ignore that culture result. Another one that you might be interested in is sinusitis. We see a lot of treatment of that, especially in the outpatient setting. And really, we only recommend that in patients that have had prolonged symptoms, a double sickening, or those with really severe symptoms. And it, unfortunately, there is this common misconception that you can tell if it's bacterial or viral based on the color of the sputum. And unfortunately, that is not true. Yep. And another thing it's commonly thought that if the patient has facial pressure, sorry, we're going to go down the otolaryngology rabbit hole now. If the patient has facial pressure, that's an indication of a sinus infection. I would argue that's a negative indicator of a sinus infection because most of those patients that have recurrent sinus pressure have sinus headaches, which are not from the sinuses. They're variants of migraine. So that patient will do better if you give them like Motrin or Excedrin and refer them to neurology than they will be from antibiotics. And you said, well, I think you said a double, not a double infection, double sickness. I know what you mean by that. Double sickness, meaning they're starting to get better and then they get worse again. Yeah. That usually means that a bacteria has taken advantage of the situation where there was a virus and has now gotten involved and an antibiotic may be helpful. Right. So a secondary infection. They're like, oh, my cold's going away. And then, you know, my cough got worse. My stuffy nose got worse. This yellow stuff started coming out of my nose. Right. Okay. So we do beat otolaryngology stuff to death here. And uh, I tend to have them <laughs> more on the show than anyone else just because of my, you know, social and professional connections. So, so we'll, we'll get away from that. Okay. So, so bacteriuria without symptoms, uh, viral upper respiratory tract infection that hasn't evolved into 
bacterial sinusitis yet. What else? So also acute otitis media that can be either viral or bacterial. And so we'll sometimes give that some time before we start giving the antibiotics out for that. And then you also, bronchitis is always a virus. And so we shouldn't be treating that with an antibiotic either. In my experience, bronchitis is often asthma. You know, a lot of people come in and a couple key questions that I tend to ask is, do you tend to get chest colds? Does it tend to go to your chest? Have you ever had bronchitis? Oh yeah, a bunch of times. Oh yeah, every winter I get bronchitis. I'm like, Okay. Have you ever used albuterol before? Oh, yeah, it's in my pocket. Well, you know, a lot of times it's in, it's undiagnosed asthma and maybe been diagnosed. They just didn't realize it. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And that's not going to create antibiotic resistance because if the inhaler doesn't work, then the inhaler doesn't work. But if it does, then fantastic. Okay. What what else? What else? Yeah. A lot of this stuff relates to otolaryngology. I love it. I love it. Except the bacteria because it can't really does. It. <laughs> yep. Uh, You also have your COPD exacerbations. Those, again, sometimes do need an antibiotic, but there's more and more data to support that if you got a negative procalcitonin, then you don't need the antibiotics. Although there is always that claim of the doxycycline anti-inflammatory effect. I thought there was macrolide anti-inflammatory effect. I thought there was azithromycin. It's supposedly, supposedly both, actually, and they'll both be used. Okay. Wait, calcitonin. So you're getting a blood test when the patient's coughing? So if you get a lot of these patients will be the ones that are hospitalized and, you know, everyone's concerned, does this person have a bacterial lower respiratory tract infection? And so procalcitonin is a really great marker in that particular population for bacterial infection. Oh, interesting. It has its limited uses otherwise. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't get I would if you're an outpatient getting a blood test, sending they're not going to appreciate that very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would assume then as a routine basis on an outpatient for a COPD patient with a bronchitis, it's also not recommended unless there's a specific reason for giving them an antibiotic for a COPD exacerbation. It's a little more tricky to discern there just because, you know, you don't know what set off the COPD exacerbation. Is it bacterial? Is it viral? Is it a number of other causes? And so it's a little bit trickier when you don't have that data Got it. Okay. to convince people not to use an antibiotic. Okay. Okay. But this is the list is getting longer. Is there anything else that you haven't mentioned yet? I think those are the big ones. I'm sure there are some I'm missing, though. Okay. So when you're doing your year in antibiotic stewardship, this is the type of stuff you're going to be looking for. Yes, definitely. Okay. Now, something that patients hear, whether they're hearing it from us or hearing it within the community, is that is that they're told if they take the same antibiotic too many times, they'll become resistant. Is that is that true? Because you know, if, if I think of it more like like a virus, like the COVID vaccine, COVID, right? To think that you're going to be the one because you took the antiviral that causes this virus to select for a mutation that's resistant to the the antivirals. Like it's really unlikely that you're going to be the one person that that happens to. Is is that the same? So in which case that logic doesn't make sense. So is it the same in bacteria? Are we really worried that this one person is going to develop the antibiotic resistance or is there something else going on? Yeah. So there's a little bit of nugget to truth to feeling like, you know, it's not the patient that becomes resistant to the antibiotic, but I can see how that message would be received if a physician told you, you know, if you use this antibiotic over and over again, it's not going to work the same. Bacteria are very smart. And so the repeated exposure to the same antibiotic can actually select for antibiotic resistant organisms that are part of that patient's microbiome. And so essentially, you're becoming colonized with these multi-drug resistant organisms when you do this. And bacteria like to share with each other. So they can not only have the ones that are like the good bacteria that are in your gut have these resistance genes, but they can share it with pathogens as well. So the microbiome really does protect patients from kind of pathogens that are out there. And the collateral damage when you're treating an infection with an antibiotic is that microbiome. Do you sometimes feel like your job has been getting monotonous? Like when you're driving to a place you've been a thousand times and you just zone out, don't even remember how you got there? A new place with new people could help you find your love for medicine again. A great way to do it is with locum tenens. If you've considered either part or full-time locum tenens, you probably have questions. I do. I've considered it and I'm not that familiar with it. So where do I look? Locumstory.com. Locumstory.com is a great resource for unbiased information and advice from physicians like us by physicians. They even have a quiz to help you determine if locums is right for you. So visit locumstory.com today 
to learn more about Locum Tenens and see if it is right for you. That's L-O-C-U-M story, all one word, dot com. Okay, so you really can end up selecting for the resistance bacteria. So you're saying that like some of us, a lot of us, maybe all of us have these resistant bacteria in our gut microbiome. Um, and when we're treating an infection, we might, might not be treating all of the bacteria of this genus and species. We're treating, our aim is to treat the ones in this particular area and eradicate it in combination with our immune system. But there are others that are being affected by the antibiotic. And so we're just allowing the resistant ones to multiply and multiply and multiply. Meanwhile, previously, they're kept in check through just the homeostasis of the gut microbiome. Exactly. So those the standard microbiome has both the resistant organisms and the susceptible organisms. And really, the wild type tends to outcompete the resistant organisms. There is some advantage to just being the kind of susceptible organism when it comes to growth. But when you wipe out all those good bacteria and all you're left with are the ones that have that resistance gene, they are going to multiply and they are going to be the predominant organism that that person has. And a lot of our infections are really our own bacteria getting into places that they shouldn't be. So gut bacteria getting into the urinary tract or, you know, something from the stomach getting up and into the lungs then or from the sinuses down into the lungs. So it's really selecting out those multi-drug resistant organisms puts you at risk. Okay. Okay. Um, speaking of good bacteria, you know, we hear a lot about probiotics, prebiotics. I'm sure someone's going to come out with postbiotics, maybe midbiotics. You never know. People love to make stuff up. It's all over the internet. I might have an episode where I just make stuff up. You won't be able to tell from any of the other episodes. So with probiotics, what you're doing is you're trying to ingest an outside bacteria to replace your your gut flora, right? Like you're going to consume a yogurt and it's going to make it through your stomach and intestines and all the way to your colon maybe to become part of your your normal gut flora somehow unharmed. Where do you fall on your recommendations to patients who, in your capacity of infectious disease doctor, you're putting sometimes on a boatload of antibiotics? Yeah, so I don't typically recommend probiotics. And the reason behind that is there's kind of mixed results with different randomized control trials about their utility in preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea or C. difficile, which is really what we'd want to use these for to prevent since you're killing off all that good bacteria in the gut. But the microbiome is, is really complex. And so kind of taking in one different strain or maybe two different strains of bacteria isn't really going to reapproximate that microbiome that you had. And in some cases, actually, they found that probiotics have actually led to bacteremias in certain critically ill patients or patients that have kind of a mucosal breakdown along the intestine. And so it's not for the most part, benign, but for some patients can actually be quite harmful. And actually, prebiotics and postbiotics both do exist, although they're a little outside my scope of practice because one's feeding the bacteria and the other one's giving you the thing that the bacteria are going to make. And so kind of outside our realm, but Wait, do exist. Given you that I just made up postbiotics. That's really a thing? <laughs> that is really a thing. <laughs> wait, <laughs> there is give, no data for wait, it. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> giving you the thing that the bacteria create, I'm thinking gas. So you're swallowing <laughs> gas? Like, or what is the thing that the bacteria create? It's like short chain fatty acids, some different enzymes and things that the end goal of having those good bacteria and what they do for you, trying to just directly give you that. But I don't really know that that's been shown to have any benefit in any kind of way. What about prebiotics? I mean, it seems reasonable to feed the gut flora what they eat, which is fiber, right? And that might help them recover. Yeah, and you can get that from your diet as well. It doesn't actually give you the bacteria. So once we've kind of wiped them out, I mean, you're feeding all the bacteria, you're not just feeding the good ones. So kind of a hit or miss thing from our standpoint. Okay, but it's never, I don't think you're ever in the wrong to tell your patients, eat fruits and vegetables, unless there's a specific That's correct. Reason. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's go, go back towards antibiotic stewardship and talk about hospital policies, health system policies around antibiotic prescribing that you think would help promote antibiotic stewardship without, you know, this delicate balance of promoting the antibiotic stewardship without impinging on the, the sovereignty, the autonomy of physician decision-making? 
Yeah. So when I think about kind of policy and and stewardship, really, we're talking about what are the two different flavors of antibiotic stewardship. So one is restrictive, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's where only certain providers can you know, authorize certain curated list of antibiotics that are of high consequence. So, you know, your carbapenems, things like that, new agents or really harmful agents. Um, So that would be on a restricted list where you'd have to go through me to get it. The other strategy, which is actually the one we use here, is audit and feedback. And so that basically we take a look at a certain population of the hospital. So say patients that have a staph aureus bacteremia and we intervene on those. Are they you know, and when I say intervene, I mean, we call, we have a conversation with the physician. This is from my area of expertise, what I recommend, but I also understand that you are at bedside and are dealing with some other things. So let's have a conversation and how we can come to the best use of antibiotics for this patient. So it like triggers a consult automatically without them calling you. So some of them are auto consults. So staph aureus bacteremia in particular, we do do an auto consult. But other things, we just have like lists that kind of filter out with our EMR that tell me, you know, this patient is on an antibiotic that doesn't match the bacteria they're growing. And so I take a look at that. I make recommendations. I don't physically see the patient. This is all just via conversations, but it can help kind of optimize that antibiotic use. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think a lot of times getting involved in just a a superficial way can can really help patient care. I mean, I'm sure you could do that like remotely to hospitals that don't have infectious disease doctors. In fact, let's start a business. That sounds like a great tele-infectious disease as you just got to, you've got to have a medical uh, license in 50 states. I've got some bad news for you. We already kind of do some of that stewardship outreach for oh, other people here. That's good news. No, that's not bad news. That's yeah. good news. It's just is not <laughs> one I'm going to profit from, which is fine, which is That's fine. correct. <laughs> okay. All right. So on the one hand, you're creating a restrictive list of antibiotics and those are the big guns, right? And then on the other side, you're creating these auto consults, but some of them are full consults and some of them are just like, you know, kind of telehealth consults. Yes. The other thing that you can do that really doesn't inhibit people's autonomy would be to give things like nudges in the EMR. So if certain bacteria resistant pattern pop up, then our micro lab has an auto, like has an auto populated list that says, you know, this looks really resistant. It's resistant to multiple beta lactams. Perhaps you could consider an ID consult without really forcing them, but just letting them know that there could be a problem with that bacteria and maybe they want to call in the professionals on that. Is there anything that's really big brotherish where you've got like an outlier prescriber? Like you've got someone who just, you know, not an infectious disease doctor, because I would hope you guys would be outliers in this, but, you know, primary care physician or maybe another specialist who just seems to be prescribing way more antibiotics than their colleagues. Is there anything like that that you're aware of either in your EMR or other in other health systems? So on the inpatient side, we look less at it from a prescriber point. You know, we look at kind of more what's happening yeah. um, from the outpatient side. That's actually a really good strategy is to track how each individual provider is doing and then kind of give them a almost a report card of here's how you do compared with the rest of your clinic, for instance. And here's ways that maybe we could improve this. And so that's another strategy we can use. And there's actually good data. There's this. I guess he's a social psychologist, Dan Ariely, who has shown in, in many different ways that people behave differently when they know they're being watched. So there don't even necessarily have to be consequences to this. You just have to know that somebody's watching you and it changes behavior. I, I read something once that if you, you put a mirror in your refrigerator and it's just you watching yourself, just the, the idea that someone's watching you is going to make you reach into the fridge a few times. And I could have used that tonight. But so, yeah. So, I mean, I think that even without having a carrot or a stick, that can change behavior. It certainly can. And, and yeah, they've shown that in stewardship that just – us watching alone will improve prescribing. And then, you know, on top of that, everything we add add is just more improvement. Anything else on the inpatient or the outpatient side that uh, you've seen either your health system do or others? Those are kind of the big categories. I mean, there's also what we call uh, academic detailing, which is basically where I sit down with those prescribers that maybe have some room for improvement and kind of go over some of the things that they specifically maybe could 
make better. Like maybe they're really great at not prescribing for bronchitis, but they struggle a little bit with duration of therapy for a UTI. And then you just kind of give that very directed feedback. Got it. Have you guys ever gotten any kind of pushback from antibiotic stewardship when you're making your recommendations or maybe it's one on one of these inpatient consults where you're just like, hey guys, I just, uh, I didn't see the patient, but I went over the labs. Like, do you find yourself getting resistance? So I try not to look at it as resistance because I think that really just creates that culture of, you know, we're the antibiotic police. And that that's not the case. We're definitely, we're all here trying to do the same thing, which is really improve outcomes for patients. So I think if you look at it from their side of, you know, I have this really sick person, you're not at bedside, you're not seeing them, that really helps to bridge that gap of, yeah, I'm, I know I'm not seeing them, but here are just some things from my area of expertise. And then you try to come to a consensus rather than have it. It's not so much pushback. Everyone is in this, you know, with the same goal in mind. And some people are just, I mean, there's concern for litigation, right? Like I'm more of an outpatient physician. I do inpatient consults, but not, you know, not frequently. So, you know, whenever I think about things, I think of like outpatient providers who are just getting hammered with patients in an urgent care, emergency department, primary care, where they're just like, everyone's sick, everyone's sick. And they're like, I've been sick for so long. Just, can I just, you know, and they're miserable. You think it's viral and just, it's so easy. It would be so hard to hold that line day in and day out. I certainly agree with that. I've actually, so the biggest thing that we can do for our outpatient providers is really giving education. And so that's not only education about, they know how to use antibiotics. They were taught that, but how do you describe that to a patient who maybe doesn't have that education and how to do that in a way that's not going to take an hour because they don't have that kind of time and how it's not going to damage their relationship with that patient. And so really the biggest things are just having kind of a contingency plan for your patients, letting them know that, yeah, antibiotics aren't going to work, but here are a couple of things that might. And so that feels like you're not only having your value back, but also you're actually able to help the patient educate them on the harms of antibiotic use. I know it's really difficult for outpatient providers to just say, you know, resistance is going to be a problem. And so I don't want to give you an antibiotic now. That's not going to be super well received by the patient. Because they're more interested in, you know, I feel really crummy right now. What can I do about this? But back to what you said earlier, we really can pull that card of, I don't want to breed resistant bacteria in you, right? Like you yes. use this stuff judiciously for you so that we can use this later and we don't have to use IV antibiotics to get that the resistant uh, bacteria later on if it's someone who tends to come in frequently. So what are some of the strategies that you use when you are, when you're talking to these inpatient physicians and, you know, the patient's really sick, it's time for them, you know, the culture results are back, it's time for them to start paring down and decreasing the spectrum, but, but they're skittish about it. Like, How do you talk someone through that anxiety? Yeah, so I love talking to patients when they're considering de-escalating. Uh, nothing makes me happier than de-escalating antibiotics. And I get it. I understand you put somebody on a regimen, maybe it's broad spectrum. And they're getting better, right? And so you think, gosh, whatever I've done, I don't want to screw it up yeah. and go back the other direction. And that's fair. I get that. It's really great when you can have that micro data that says, you know, this is an E. coli and I can use any of the antibiotics here. So, you know, talking those those physicians back to, you know, maybe ceftriaxone or maybe even an oral option is a lot easier when I have that kind of data. It's a little bit harder when, you know, we have somebody that came in real sick, put them on antibiotics, broad spectrum, never really find a source of infection, but they do get better. And then trying to walk back when you don't have that kind of data. And so that's kind of a different strategy where I try like to peel things back one by one. I usually start with my gram positive coverage. So my vancomycin comes off first because, you know, MRSA, it's going to grow. It's not one of those things that's going to be skittish and not grow. And so start by taking that off if nothing has grown in 48 hours in my cultures. And then maybe look at my anaerobic coverage because typically those patients aren't super sick. So if I don't have a clear source of where an anaerobe could be coming from, like a belly infection, probably don't need that. And then finally, taking a look at my gram-negative coverage. You know, is this person high risk for a multidrug-resistant bacteria? Are they low risk? Do they seek a lot of health care? Those all kind of go into my decision when I'm talking of two physicians about healing back antibiotics. And when you do have a culture result that can give you some direction, like let's say there are a number of different antibiotics. Let's say it's community-acquired MRSA, 
right? So you can mm-hmm. use doxycycline. Again, I'm thinking more outpatient. You can use doxycycline <laughs> or Bactrim, maybe clindamycin. And then there's this data on the on the right side of the culture results that tells you whether it's sensitive, resistant, and then it's gonna it gives you a number. Now, is that of any clinical significance? Because I'd heard in the past, in my training, the answer was no, it's not. Don't use that because it's not going to tell you which one is going to be more lethal to the bacteria. Is that correct or Yeah, so we're talking about MIC. Yep, that's MIC. It's the minimum inhibitory concentration. And so basically what that is, is in a very controlled lab setting, I have a very controlled number of bacteria, and I'm giving them a very certain amount of antibiotic. What is the smallest amount of antibiotic I can give them and to inhibit that growth? So different bacteria have different MICs to different antibiotics. So even if I compare, say, a Staph aureus to a Staph lugdunensis, they're very similar. They might have a different MIC for, say, the same antibiotic like Bactrim. And that number doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning to you unless you're looking at them frequently. And so I wouldn't recommend using that. There's actually some cases like where the doxy, for instance, to MRSA, its MIC is eight. And so that sounds really bad. It's actually sensitive. Whereas the VANC is four. It's a smaller number than eight. You'd think that'd be better, but that's actually resistant. So you probably shouldn't be using VANC. So it really doesn't correlate quite that well as with the numbers. And so just looking at if they're susceptible or if they're resistant is really where I would have most physicians looking. Okay. I mean, is there any particular strategy that you use when you have a number of them at your disposal and you're you're going to pick one for them to, let's say you've got an inpatient and they're on a IV regimen and you're switching them to oral You've got a couple to choose from. How are you making that decision? So I want to use the narrowest spectrum that's available to me. And I want to make sure that whatever antibiotic I'm using has good penetration to whatever site. So, you know, if I'm treating a bloodstream infection, I don't want to use doxycycline, even if it's susceptible, because it just it kind of goes out of the blood really quickly. But it's great for any tissue penetration. So just making sure you're keeping those things in mind and then picking the narrowest spectrum you have. Okay. I mean, I could see some people kind of doing it the other way, right? I'm going to pick the broadest spectrum because I just want to make sure this patient gets better. But, right, this lecture is about antibiotic stewardship because we do, yes, we want to make sure the patient gets better, but we want to make sure we can use antibiotics again on them and other people. The whole premise of today's conversation. Okay. Yes. And you definitely want to go with the narrow spectrum rather than the broad spectrum when you know what you're treating because, you know, you're going to get the same result. You're going to kill that bacteria. But the goal is to not have that collateral damage to every other bacteria in that person. Yeah. Yeah. And minimize the side effects. Yeah. So before we go, I, I just want to go through, and this might be a little longer, C- the CDC core elements for antibiotic stewardship. So I, I guess that could be kind of a lecture or, or a conversation unto itself, but just you know, for those of us out there that might be tested on something like this, let's just go through the points that the CDC makes about antibiotic stewardship. Yeah. So the core elements are really designed to help you build a framework for your program. So this is, you know, to build the stewardship program itself rather than just kind of applying to an individual basis how to be a better steward. And so there are kind of the three care settings where they've set these, and they're all pretty similar, which is some slight variation depending on kind of what care setting you're in. So if you're in the hospital, in a long-term care facility, or if you're in the outpatient setting, but they're all pretty similar. So the first three of the inpatient core elements are really developing who your team is. So it's getting hospital leadership commitment. So that means having the financial support of your institution and the support of your institution to go ahead and do this. Then you need your two leaders. So that's one physician and one pharmacist. So that's number two and three on your core elements. So you want to make sure you have a physician who's going to be responsible for this, as well as a pharmacist to help. Then it's kind of what are we going to do with this program? So you have your action. That's literally what am I doing? What kind of intervention am I putting into place? And you have your tracking where you actually take a look as is my intervention doing anything and is it acting as expected? And then reporting, which can be to national organizations, uh, back to your hospital board saying, you know, these are what I've done and this is what it did um, and kind of the effects I've had. And then finally, education. 
And that's kind of education at all levels, to prescribers, to patients, to the hospital itself. It's just kind of broad education. So these are really broad frameworks, and they kind of give suggestions of what to do at various places. Um, And the outpatient setting, they kind of combined these into just four core elements. Um, But again, they have very similar ideas. Great. Fantastic. So any, any parting words for our physician listeners on, you know, what's maybe the biggest takeaway if they remember nothing else from today for antibiotic stewardship? Use the narrowest, shortest duration that is safe for your patient uh, would be my biggest takeaway. Excellent. And if people want to find you online, let's say, you know, they want to follow you on Twitter or find you on LinkedIn, anywhere that we can find you. Yes, I am on Twitter, but I'm going to be honest, I'm not very active on it. And so I can't even tell you what my Twitter handle is at this point. (laughs) Good. Keep it that way. Keep it that way. You've got better things to do with your time. All right. Fantastic. So, Dr. Mackenzie Kynes, thank you so much for your time. This has been a very educational and a fun conversation and, uh, you know, looking forward to great things from you as you're building your antibiotic stewardship program. Thanks so much, Brad. Glad to be on and help people out with some stewardship interventions. Thanks for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast player. I'm also available for medical legal consulting and keynote speaking if you're interested, or to just give us some feedback on the show, email me at brad at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com. I'll see you next week. The ideas expressed in this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. Those in this podcast accept no liability for medical decisions based on the information herein. And as the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice. This does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. And if you have a medical problem, seek medical attention.